everyone that we are recording this event. Please stay on mute. You may type questions in the chat box and we'll dis address during or at the end of the presentation. We may also open the floor at the end so that you can unmute your mic and ask questions then. And now um, for our speaker, Dr. George Lole. He is a board certified cardiologist who joined Franciscan Physician Network Indiana Heart Physicians in 2020. So he's our a pandemic baby. A graduate of University of Damascus facility, Faculty of Medicine, he completed his residency at the University of Kentucky. He did his fellowship in cardiovascular disease at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga and an additional fellowship in advanced cardiovascular imaging at the University of Utah. Dr. Lole is co-director of advanced cardiovascular imaging and medical director of the Franciscan Cardiovascular Genetics Program. Welcome, Dr. Lole. Um, thank you, Don, for this um, kind introduction. Um, are you able to see my slides? Perfect. So yes, I'll, first, I want to thank everyone for joining us at 530. I know I mean, all of our attendees want to be with their families, so I'll try to be uh, brief, but also helpful. Um, so today we're talking about cardiovascular uh, genetics, but well, my goal is to make it more relatable to uh, our primary care providers and extended providers in general. And so the first topic will be familial hyperlipidemias. And, and like Don said, there are no financial conflict of interest related to this talk. Um, when it comes to familial hyperlipidemias, there are three main uh, topics that I would like to cover. The first is the FH, which is familial hypercholesterolemia, and then hyperlipoproteinemia A, and then finally, uh, familial hypertriglyceridemia. And so I'll start with a question, and, and you don't have to uh, give me an answer, but something to think about, I guess. Um, if you have two men, age 40, with each with an LDL of uh, C of 190 milligram per deciliter, one has a monogenic FH and the other one does not. Um, the risk is similar in both since the LDL levels are the same, true or false. Or false. I'm going to hold off on the answer for now and see what you think um, afterwards. And so here is a case, um, a 28 year old male, his mother had cabbage when she was 38. Um, at age five, his total cholesterol was around 500. Um, he was started on Questron. Uh, he quit in his twenties. He started smoking in his 16. And, and then later in life, he was found to have uh, tendon xanthomas. xanthomas. Uh, fast forward five years later, when he was 32 years old, he, he developed angina, uh, severe three vessel obstructive coronary artery disease, uh, ended up with uh, coronary artery bypass surgery, multiple MIs afterwards. Um, 10 years later, he was seen in an atherosclerotic clinic. The invasive coronary angiogram showed two vein grafts that were occluded. He underwent a PCI and he was started on a Torvastan. Five years after, he was in his mid 40s. He had recurrent anginas, PCIs, and he was switched to a higher intensity stand and underwent bilateral carotid stenting. And then later in life, he was admitted with advanced terminal heart failure. Um, and unfortunately, his son also ended up having cabbage when he was 23. And then, given that he had terminal heart failure, he ended up with VAT. And so, from what I want you uh, to know from this slide is that. If you're a young adult with, with MI, there is a one in 10 chance that you might have um, genetic predisposition. If, you have, if you're young with an, uh, and develop an MI and you have family history of early onset coronary artery disease, two in 10 of those patients will have uh, a pathogenic variant when it comes to familial hyperlipidemias. If you have MI, you're young, and your LDL at the time of the event is more than, one, more than 160, not even 190, four in 10 of those young adults uh, turn out, turns out to have um, FH. And then if you have all the risk factors, meaning you're young with an MI, with family history of premature coronary artery disease, and an LDL greater than 160, six in 10 will have familiar hyperlipidemia. Uh, and, 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 and again, the numbers are not that high, 160. Um, other, um, from a prevalence standpoint, um, the average LDL, 
um, is around 180 in, in families with hypercholesterolemia. And unfortunately, given that it's underdiagnosed, almost 50% of those patients are not even on statin therapy prior to their MI. Um, and 50% of, 50, 50 of patients at the time of MI or an acute coronary event leave the hospital with uh, on high intensity stan. The, the remaining of them are not even on a high intensity stan, which should be available for every provider. Uh, from this slide, again, it, it highlights the fact that if you have an acute coronary syndrome and you're uh, uh, younger than 65 years or and your LDL is more than 160, there is an 8.7% chance you, you might have a pathogenic mutation. So the, the disease or the, uh, the genetic component of it is out there. It's not as rare as we would like to think. And then when it comes to monogenic FH, if you look to your left, you can see the normal uptake of LDL in a healthy hepatocyte, right? So you have your LDL and it gets captured by the receptor. And then from there, it gets degraded in the uh, hepatocyte. Um, you might have a problem in the receptor itself. So that would lead to higher LDL levels in the bloodstream or circulation. Or you might have a problem in the apolipoprotein B. And so it would limit uh, building the LDL-C to LDL receptor. And so the, in other words, the LDL particles cannot bind to the receptor itself. Or you have... Uh, high recycling of the uh, LDL receptors when you have a pathogenic uh, mutation in the PCSK9 uh, enzyme. But what ends up happening is that uh, you'll have higher PCSK9 levels, um, which will lead to uh, degradation of the receptor itself and higher LDL levels. So you might have problems in different levels when it comes to LDL capturing. So when it comes to uh, FH, what do you need to know in order to screen, or when do, when should you think about it? Well, obviously it starts with a, a plasma LDL, but also you should screen for the personal history of uh, ACS, ASCVD. Also look at the family history of ASCVD, family history of elevated cholesterol, your clinical exam. So if you have xanthoma, Arcus, or a positive genetic test, that can be applicable uh, in what we call, or you can use a DLCN calculator. So if you if you Google DLCN calculator, it will basically give you the tool to plug all of this data and it will tell you if this patient has low likelihood, high likelihood, probable uh, chance of having FH. And so you can make an educated decision based on this data once you plug it into the calculator to make up your mind on whether this patient would benefit from genetic testing or not. And, and, and it's available. It was basically based on a Dutch study that was done a few years ago. And so you can use that as a, as a tool uh, to help you uh, funnel the appropriate patients for testing. Um, and as you can see, the high DLCN score was associated with monogenic familial hyperlipidemia. And, and, and in those patients, only 4% only of those patients had an LDL more than 190. So the uh, takeaway message is that you, you shouldn't wait for an LDL of 190 to start screening those patients. You have to look at the entire picture, the personal history, the family history, the LDL level, um, and your clinical exam, essentially. And you can see here that um, the risk uh, for major cardiovascular events is beyond uh, the LDL level itself. So in patients, when they match them to uh, based on their LDL, the red uh, stands for patients who have uh, FH and blue patients who don't. And you can see that the uh, odds ratio of having an event, acute coronary event or a major ad adverse cardiovascular event is, is twice as high, even, even though your LDL level is matched. And so that's why this, it's important to screen those patients, find them early and, and start them on, uh, on good old stand therapy. So you, you found a patient, you suspect they have FH, you test them, and theoretically uh, they, um, the, the testing comes back positive for pathogenic mutation. What, how can you help them? Obviously, you check their lipid panel. And I would encourage people more and more nowadays to check their lipoprotein A because there's, there are multiple therapies that will be available to our patients over the next two years or so. And then you can 
talk about doing a calcium score, which is really affordable at Franciscan Health compared to bigger uh, other major alliances out there. If they're symptomatic, you can obtain a stress testing. And, and some of the guidelines say that if your calcium score is more than five, 400, it would be reasonable to obtain stress testing, even if they're asymptomatic, if you want to further risk stratify. And then you can also look for remodeling um, uh, that would manifest in a reduction in the heart function or a dilation in the heart based on an echocardiogram. So those four things are um, uh, what you need to folk or order or um, uh, obtain uh, in someone with uh, high risk uh, for FH or even if they test positive. So what do you do? How do you treat those patients? So honestly, as simple as it sounds, it, uh, diet and physical activity are uh, paramount and their cornerstone when it comes to management of hyperlipidemia in general, and even more important when it comes to FH therapy. Obviously, if they're active smokers, you counsel them about smoking cessation. And then therapy, you would start with your affordable uh, stands, ideally high intensity stand. And then from there, you can build uh, further therapy. So if their uh, LDL is still elevated, LDLC is still elevated, you can add azetamide, you can add pempidoic acid, which is now available. And there was an article that came out in Nijum uh, during the last ACC meeting that demonstrated that pempidoic acid can be a good alternative to high intensity stands and, and patients are intolerant in combination with azetamide. And then you have your bi-acid sequestrants. If they're resistant or they're intolerant, um, then you have more and more options. And it honestly comes down to documentation. If they're intolerant to statins, multiple high intensity statins, so your atorvastatin or suvastatin, then you can go for PCSK9 inhibitors. Now you also have inclycerin. It's still a little pricey, but long term will be more affordable. The, the neat thing about it, it, it's the frequency of administration twice a year. And then the avinucumab is available in Europe, but not available in, uh, in the States. Uh, for non-drug options, uh, I put lipoprotein a, uh, apheresis here. Obviously, it's not practical from a, uh, a clinic standpoint, but it's the only viable option for lipoprotein A, elevated lipoprotein A levels. But uh, again, stay tuned over the next two years or so, you'll have more uh, user-friendly or medical therapy options for elevated lipoprotein A. Um, again, in patients with FH, and glycerin once was studied, and there was a drastic sustained uh, reduction of around 50% in your LDLC when they were started in, in, in glycerin therapy. And the earlier you start, the better, because again, it's all about screening and making sure those patients don't, don't get into the secondary and tertiary prevention phase, but rather keep them in the primary prevention state. Um, this drug is not available here, but I just wanted to bring bring it to your attention. The uh, avinucumab is available in um, um, uh, Europe, uh, and uh, it's also, I think, monthly injection, and it has shown sustainable and significant reduction in the LDLC level. Um, in children, because uh, if you screen families, you're going to end up with some uh, children that might have um, a pathogenic variant, statins, do not appear to affect growth, they're, they're benign, uh, so they don't affect growth, maturation, or educational levels. Um, the age of initiation, uh, eight years old for pravastatin, uh, 10 years or older, uh, then you can use more, you have more options, simvastatin, lovastatin, atorvastatin, or rosuvastatin. The goal, obviously, of therapy is to reduce your LDLC below the 95th percentile, so less than 130, um, milligram per deciliter or have a 50% reduction from baseline. And then it is safe to use azetamide as well in children. Um, Evolucumab in pediatric heterozygous FH has been studied and it's it's been uh, shown to be uh, safe. And again, compared to placebo, you have almost a 45% reduction in your uh, LDL level compared to uh, placebo. Um, from there, we're going to shift gears and talk about um, hyperlipoproteinemia uh, A. Um, I bring it up during this talk because you will see more and more therapy and in, in papers um, published over the next two years. And so until now, the physiological role is not well established. It's only present in primates, not in all mammals. Um, the levels are determined by genetic factors and they differ by race. Um, and, and they're a major carrier of the oxidized phospholipids. And why do we care? Well, it turns out uh, 
hyperlipoproteinemia A is atherogenic, pro-inflammatory, and inhibits uh, fibrinolysis. Um, how do hey, you- Dr. Lole? Yeah. Uh, excuse me, You your uh, video is frozen. I don't know if maybe you turn off your camera and then turn it back on and see if that helps. Does that work? There, there you go. That's better. Thank you. Okay. Um, so therapy, uh, currently you just treat them the way you treat uh, LDLC uh, or elevated LDL. So statins, uh, omega-3, PCSK9 inhibitor. You can actually do lipoprotein apheresis, but obviously that's not practical and you will have more and more therapies uh, coming, up, coming up in the future. Um, briefly, I'm just going to go over other familial um, hyper, uh, hyperlipidemias. Number one, your hyper, familial hypertriglyceridemia happens to be autosomal dominant disorder. And I say that because we, we get to test for all of those and our, our counselor is pretty good when it comes to the other variants. And so it's an autosomal dominant disorder due to inactivating mutation of the lipoprotein lipase gene. And then you have the familial hyper uh, micronemia syndrome, an extremely rare, but it's worthwhile mentioning. How do those present? How do those patients uh, manifest? They can present with pancreatitis, eruptive xanthomas, lipemia retinalis, and hepatosplenomegaly. Um, and usually they're. Uh, Pretty symptomatic when your uh, uh, total uh, or triglyceride is greater than equal to or greater than 800, um, and at that point you have high risk for pancreatitis. Um, therapies that you have to keep in mind: omega-3, fibrate, vasipa at this point. Um, so you have therapeutic, affordable or reasonably affordable therapeutic options for hypertriglyceridemia. And there are other drugs out there that are being studied at this point in phase three and phase phase two and phase three, uh, and um, we should hear about them uh, in the foreseeable future. And then lastly, the other two variants that I'll talk about are the familial combined hyperlipidemia. It's uh, a complex condition. It occurs in one, one or two percent of the population. Obviously, it's associated with high risk for major cardiovascular events. And then your familial this beta lipoproteinemia and it will also manifest uh, with xanthomas, and it also, like other uh, subtypes of familial hyperlipidemia, they all respond to medical therapy, statins, and the PC PCSK9 inhibitors, and azetamine. And so, in summary, when it comes to uh, familial hyperlipidemia, not all hypercholesterolemia are the same. Consider FH in young uh, cardiovascular patients, or those who have strong family history. Uh, you have calculators that, like the DLCN that uh, you can use and it'll help to guide you. The lipoproteinemia A is a casual risk factor. I would encourage to um, make it more of a habit to measure it moving forward. Um, Hypertriglyceridemia is a risk factor for uh, coronary artery disease and pancre pancreatitis in general. And familial combined hyperlipidemia is common and is treatable as well. And there are current therapies and future therapies uh, coming down the pipeline. So I'll switch gears to something also common when it comes to uh, uh, um, internal medicine and uh, a primary care world as well, which are the urotopathies. And if you look at this uh, illustration here that you can see the majority, more than 60 to 70% of them are sporadic. They just happened, that patient happened to have a dilated aorta. And then you see there what you, you were taught in med school, these syndromes, the Marfan and the Lewis Dietz and whatnot. I have not seen one yet uh, in five years. But then what's what's more relatable to you is that you'll see the familial cases the or the urotopathy cases associated with a bicuspid aortic valve. Why does that matter? When it comes to uh, thoracic aortic aneurysms, obviously the phenotype itself is normal those patients don't have extra aortic manifestations. You make the diagnosis with uh, an, uh, as simple as an echocardiogram or a CT chest. And then the genetic testing, the yield is not too bad. It's around 20%. Um, and so that's why I bring it up to your attention, because when we talk about your autopathies, it's not always the syndromes that you were taught in medical school. And so I, I try to educate all of my patients who have uh, and you order once at least it gets to 4.5 centimeter or greater uh, and talk to them about the benefits of uh, genetic testing. 
Um, there are multiple mutations uh, that can lead to an erythropathy. Um, obviously, you don't have to remember the uh, the specifics, but the point is there are multiple uh, uh, multiple ones, and the yield is around 20% again. And then when it comes to erythropathies plus bicuspid aortic valve, uh, why, why is that why is it more interesting? Why do we care about that? For for a few reasons. Number one, the bicuspid aortic valve itself tend, tends to degenerate in a faster fa fashion compared to a tricuspid aortic valve. On exam, you're going to hear an aortic murmur. Usually it's a harsh, low end murmur. You'd have a click. And on an imaging, you, you'll see both. You, you'll see a bicuspid valve and a dilated aorta or aortopathy. And it's important to ask those patients if they have family history, has um, their father or mom underwent uh, a valve replacement, and talk to them about the importance of genetic testing. Um, there are multiple genes that can affect the bicuspid aortic valve or seen with, uh, with bicuspid aortic valve, and they're usually uh, seen or found on genes 5, 13, and 18. Um, and no genes on the X chromosome have been linked to bicuspid aortic valve. Uh, the NOTCH1 gene uh, is common in those patients. And it encodes a large protein involved in signaling pathway that participates in cell differentiation during organogenesis, and it's associated with bicuspid aortic valve. So in, in this patient population, the, when you have bicuspid aortic valve and an aortopathy, the aorta itself is abnormal. And so, and why is that? Because it's associated with accelerated, this abnormal tissue or media would lead to accelerated degeneration of the aortic media, you have matrix disruption and smooth muscle loss or ap apoptosis. And the MMP activity may be elevating those enzymes, and that's why you have accelerated degeneration in both the aorta and the bicuspid aortic valve. How is that clinic, uh, clinically uh, relatable? Well, you have to screen those patients and keep a, cl a close eye on them. Now, what this uh, illustration shows you that the incidence of dissection in general is low in patients with thoracic aortic aneurysms, but it's still higher compared to patients who don't have uh, a, a genetic predisposition or a, a genetic, genetic variant. So it's low, but higher compared to your normal population. Um, and this is more of a, a, a interesting numbers that you'll, you'll get to, uh, be asked about when you uh, recertify. So with Turner syndrome, you repair at 2.5 centimeter per meter squared. With Lewis Dietz at four, with Marfan at five or greater, with bicuspid aortic valve, it's similar to other aortopathies at 5.5 centimeter or greater. Um, and now we'll uh, change gears one more time and before we go to some relatable examples. So we're going to talk about another common finding you see in your clinic, which is dilated cardiomyopathy. And there are certain terms that I, I just want you to be aware of. Number one, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. So it's obviously defined by a primary myocardial disease of unknown cause, characterized by left ventricular or biventricular dilation and impaired of the contractility. You have familial dilated cardiomyopathy, and, and this, is, this, is, this highlights the importance of screening uh, families or talking to them about your family history. So it's defined by two closely related family members who meet the criteria for dilated cardiomyopathy, meaning weak heart and dilated, or so two family members or a first degree relative who had sudden cardiac death around the age 35 to 50 years old. If you have either or, then you met the criteria for familial DCM. Genetic DCM is DCM plus a pathogenic variant. Sporadic DCM is DCM with no pathogenic variant. And I'll go over why is it important, and it goes above and beyond um, a, a, a cascade screening for family members. But this is what, we, what it looks like in an echocardiogram. When you look in the ultrasound, um, for the non-cardiologists, um, essentially what you need to pay attention to is that the ventricles, the chambers look big and balloony, so they're, and that's why they're weak. And so you have uh, thin walls and uh, big ventricles. Um, red flags that you can ask your um, um, your patient about when it comes to um, family history of DCM, sudden cardiac death, uh, sudden infant death syndrome, unexplained syncope, seizures without, uh, without objective ictal activity, heart transplant in the absence of coronary artery disease, obviously, 
the presence of an ICD, a defibrillator, and a young family member. Uh, and ideally, the, the age will be less than 60 to 70, because once you get to that age, they probably have atherosclerotic disease. You should screen for just muscle weakness and myopathy history in their family, drowning when they're swimming, motor vehicle accidents that were not explained. You'll be surprised if you ask. And then, you know, when they probe, when they tell you, oh, so-and-so had a heart attack, ask them what age were they? Because if they were 35, 40 years old, it could be an acute coronary syndrome, but there, there's a high likelihood chance it might be a cardiomyopathy, whether it's DCM, HCM, or infiltrative disease. So, so probe and go uh, above and beyond just um, uh, uh, the, the traditional answer of, oh yeah, my, my cousin or my sister had died from a heart attack or my mother had a heart attack when she was 40 years old. P probe more. Um, epidemi so when it comes to prevalence, um, 30, you usually have 36 cases per 100,000. It's less than 1% of the general population. Um, and it counts for almost 40% of all heart failure cases. And 25 to 30 have an identifiable, uh, identifiable family component of predisposition. So whether it's idiopathic or familial, you should, so whether they have immediate family members with the disease or not, you should do genetic test testing in the proband to see if they have a, a, a genetic variant. Um, and this is essentially an illustration of all the possible genes that can be affected. The myosin heavy chain, the cardiac muscle troponin, another big one, or lamin AC, and the, there are a lot of phase two and three trials targeting this uh, pathogenic variant in dilated cardiomyopathy, and then the tropomyosin, among other um, um, genes. But why does that matter? Just for you to know, I guess that down the road, though, you have more, ther or our patients will have more therapeutic options targeting their uh, pathogenic variants. And when it comes to the inheritance pat pattern, um, it's all over. So it could be autosomal dominant, recessive, mitochondrial, or, or X-linked. Usually, uh, you, they would have other associations. So if it's mitochondrial, you would have hearing uh, myopathies. Um, and then the penetrance, which is important. So just because you test positive for a gene from a practical standpoint, you don't necessarily have to have the disease then. You might have it 10 years from now. You might have it later. And that's where the counseling is important. So uh, we would explain to them that just because you have a gene, it doesn't mean that you'll end up with the disease. There is a higher likelihood, but it's not always the case. And so uh, another thing to keep in mind, not that you have to remember the details, is that there is overlap between certain genes when it comes to dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, non-compaction and restrictive. And so that's where our job as a cardiologist is to figure out which or what, what is the phenotype manifestation of that pathogenic variant. Um, but there is overlap. So just because you see a patient with a certain variant, doesn't it doesn't automatically um, uh, direct you towards uh, a certain disease. And so um, uh, what, what this um, slide is telling you is, is something that I went over already, which is just because you have the pathogenic mutation, it's not doom and gloom. You might, your, that gene might manifest itself or express itself in a phenotype, and it might not. And even, even if it does, it doesn't mean terminal end stage heart failure. It could be a mild reduction in heart function. If captured early, uh, it might stay that way, or it might lead to a, a ballooned, big, good old dilated cardiomyopathy. So just because you have the gene, it's not always bad news. Um, now, why do we screen? Um, well, first, let me show you how, I guess, what we what goes through our mind, right? So you have a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy, if they have a pathogenic variant already known, then you screen their uh, immediate family members. If they don't, then you would screen for uh, familial uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. You'd ask about immediate family members. You'd ask about sudden cardiac death. If if they it turns out uh, they do, then it's familial. If if the gene is negative and they don't have immediate family members affected by the disease or fam or have family history of dilated cardiomyopathy, then it's more of a sporadic case. So it's important to uh, ask those patients if their immediate family members have the disease itself. And why is all of that important? Because you get to screen those patients and treat them early 
early on. And the earlier you find the disease and you start those patients on guideline directed medical therapy, the better their outcomes are. Now, if uh, if a patient shows up in your clinic and say, hey, my mom has heart failure and I have the gene, should I see a cardiologist or when should I get an echocardiogram? Uh, the short uh, answer would be every three to five years. Again, if you have the gene, but you don't have the disease. Um, and you should encourage, and this is another important point, uh, you should encourage patients uh, who have a, a variant to discuss this finding with their with their immediate family members because it's only right for them to know uh, to get screened, so to speak. So I would encourage encourage you to have more have that conversation or, or discussion with your patients, just because um, although it's your information. But we would encourage you to share that information with your immediate family member because it, direct, it can directly affect them. And again, it shows you that if you screen early on, you, can, you start them on cheap therapy, they will do much better. Um, also, why is it important? Um, some studies out there, and we're trying to use that more and more in our practice, uh, sudden cardiac death has been associated with certain uh, pathogenic variants compared to other, and so hopefully we will be using those uh, uh, genetic testing to guide guide us further uh, to see who would benefit from an ICD placement. Because right now there is mixed data when it comes to non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy, and so um, a paper has demonstrated that patients with lamin AC pathogenic variant have much higher risk compared to another patient with heart failure without the variant at sudden cardiac death. So you would make more of a, an educated decision or a shared decision between you and your patient when it comes to uh, uh, the need for an ICD or not. So again, it's it's above and beyond cascade screening. You're also further risk stratifying and you would avoid unnecessary procedures when it comes to those patients. Um, I don't have to... Uh, or you with the ICD therapy, but again, if you have VT, uh, LVEF low, uh, low LVEF, uh, certain mutations, uh, you would have higher risk for um, sudden cardiac death, and we would we will worry about that. But but again, the point is, certain mutations are associated with higher risk. Um, essentially, those slides are talking about certain therapies coming down the pipeline when it comes to. Um, uh, uh, gene directed therapy. Um, and you can see why is it important too? Because patients with certain, uh, like the Titan gene mutation, those patients have done worse compared to uh, the, uh, the cohort without the pathogenic variant. So you, you might, you would like to keep a closer eye on those patients to monitor for accelerated progression of uh, cardiomyopathy and the need for early uh, mechanical support, so to speak. And th this, I, I it's more mainstream now. I, you know, I heard a few days ago that oh, uh, genetic testing is more of a niche thing, and it really isn't. At at this point, it's more of uh, more uh, more standard of care, and uh, we owe it to our patients to uh, uh, screen them, especially that it's pretty affordable. And our counselor who's sitting right next to me will go over that as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop and ask Beth, who's sitting right next to me, to share a couple of cases with you, if the time permit and then uh, open it up for questions. Hi everybody, I'm Beth, I'm the genetic counselor. I wanted to go over um, a couple different cases. The first one is a, um, a case, a reason for referral, 18 year old female with a history of hypercholesterol. Um, her parents began checking her cholesterol levels as part of an incentive program. Her levels were slowly climbing over the years. And interestingly, the elevations increased to 235 while she was on atorvastatin. She was not tolerating the atorva, um, and so she currently wasn't taking any medication when she came to see me. She was having more than unusual levels of fatigue. She's a dance instructor. And then additionally, she had Hashimoto's at 16. Um, so here's a series of her laboratory workups. So you can see they began screening her in um, August of 2016. And then she continues to be screened. Um, and the um, I continued adding the data um, after she uh, became a patient of our practice. But you can see the levels do start to climb. I'm reaching some pretty high levels by January of 2019. 
So when we look at her family history, um, family histories um, for genetics is kind of really important. Um, the circles are females, the men are squares, um, the arrow on the bottom down here, this is our patient. Um, and she has a sister, this is her dad or mom. And if we start to look at the family history that was collected at her appointment, um, her father had um, high cholesterol at the age of 18. He's got a sister and also a brother with it. And then through his father, the patient's paternal grandfather, um, heart attack at the age of 33 for his first one. And then um, another one for the paternal great uncle um, at age 50. So um, her testing was done. They did an analysis of four genes. That's the basic panel that we do for hypercholesterolemia. Um, that accounts for about 90% of the cases of hypercholesterolemia. Sorry for the copy. I was trying to cut and paste from Epic. Um, so she is, has a positive result. She has a pathogenic mutation detected. And this lets us know it's autosomal dominant, um, variable penetrance and expression as well. And when both parents are carriers, interestingly, they can both, they have a chance to have high cholesterol, but if they each pass their copy of the gene with a change on it to a child at the same time, that is, um, those children can have serious complications by the time they're 10. And that's why it's important to screen those patients like the example I demonstrated earlier, because they can start having events early on in life. And so you can treat them or capture those patients that will be paramount. And just, uh, we didn't cover that, but how can they, how would any provider order testing? What's the order number for them too? So within our system, if they have, um, if they're associated with Franciscan, we have a referral number 237. And that is um, a referral to an ambulatory referral to a cardiovascular genetic counselor. Um, if they are not associated with uh, the Franciscan system, we do have a scheduler. Um, she's available, we can fax over information to her, or we have a phone number to call and get more information as I have to send referrals. And when it comes to affordability, uh, Beth, you need to walk us through that as well. Good point. Um, we use what's called, we use the Invite laboratory. We use Invite because they do great science and they also are so committed to getting the testing to the patients that absolutely want and need the testing. Um, so if patients have Medicaid, Medicare product, um, and Vitae accepts whatever the, those companies offer. If they have commercial insurance, and Vitae verifies with their commercial insurance company and will let the patient know what the out-of-pocket is. If it's anything more than $250, that is the patient pay price. And if the commercial insurance straight up declines it, patient price is $100 or less. And included in the cost of that testing is actually testing for all relatives. I um, mean, they have 150 days to get everybody in to be tested. So kind of the benefit of this, as Dr. Lolly said, is that we would be able to test family members and be able to see whether they have the mutation or not that's been identified in the family and begin screening them. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we can go to the next example too. Okay, so this one, um, I just wanted to show the power of um, testing and cascade, what we call cascade screening. We had a 45-year-old female referred for cardiomyopathy. She has a lengthy history. Um, she has some episodes of chest discomfort. I'm radiating to her left shoulder and down her left arm, history of anxiety. She's almost sure it's not related to the anxiety. These episodes are about three times a week. Um, as typical with our patients, she describes a flip-flopping in her heart and short runs of forceful beats. Um, and um, her rate usually is typically in the 70s. So she had a stress exo at Johnson Memorial um, and it's showing normal ventricular function. Um, the study was called abnormal due to the ischemia, but she's already showing a, se a symmetric septal hypertrophy with an intraventricular septal thickness and the posterior wall thickness. 
So when we did her family history, she is the... May I stop you there just for a second? Even yes. for our uh, providers who order uh, stress echocardiograms, and once you have moderate uh, thickness in general, even if the uh, quote-unquote stress part is normal, I would encourage you to send those patients to us to uh, look at other diseases that are usually or tend to be uh, or have heritable component, right? So in this in this case, asymmetrical hypertrophy is a buzzword. Other cases, if you have significant thickness, uh, we would love to see those patients. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. um, and so this is her family history that I took at her appointment. Uh, circles again are women, squares are men, and the arrow is by the patient. She was uh, diagnosed at 45 years of age. And if you start to look, um, going up, her mother um, has had three ablations and she's getting ready to have her fourth ablation. She has HCM as well. And then her maternal grandmother had, she died of actually of a stroke at 83, but she developed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at 80 years of age. And then of course we include other family members like um, the, the uh, maternal grandfather who had a stroke. Um, and then there was a little bit concerning um, her daughter down here. She had thyroid removed and she was having tachycardia. Um, so they weren't quite sure kind yeah. of if that went with it or not. And you know what's interesting about this slide? Uh, it, it shows the point that just because you have a pathogenic variant, you might not manifest the disease till later on in life. And usually the longer it takes to uh, have that phenotype or whatever disease you do, uh, the more benign that disease will be in general. And so now you can see the top right, the aunt who had uh, HCM, it was found when she was 80 years old. So she, the onset or the phenotype presented probably in her, uh, if I have to guess, 40, 40 to 50 years old, and it was uh, it was not that significant at that time for her to have symptoms. And two then, um, following the guidelines, um, the, the patient's aunts had already had normal echoes and EKGs following the guidelines to have um, screening if a first degree relative is diagnosed with HCM. And here, interestingly enough, we have a cousin to the patient that died at 20 years of age in an unexplained motor vehicle accident. So that's basically a single patient driving a car, goes off the road, and they can't find any reason for that. Um, so it may have been they had the ventricular tachycardia first cause of death. So her results, genetic test results, she has one pathogenic variant in the MyBPC3 gene. This is a huge gene in both HCM and DCM. Um, her variant is listed here. One of the genes has a change and it's pathogenic. We looked at 168 different genes for her. Um, and this is a sarcomeric gene that encodes for the myosin binding protein that's exclusively expressed in the heart. Approximately 42 patients, percent of patients with HCM will have this, um, a change in this gene. And interestingly enough, we're, we're learning that significantly higher number of patients with a positive family history will come up with a, um, a variant in the gene. It's autosomal dominant every generation, but as always variable penetrance with variable expressivity. Um, and of course, here is the report. Um, it's also a, it's also associated with several other things. So at this point, we kind of look at the results and see what the patient's uh, presentation is. And then what we also do is then we go back and do cascade screening for family members. So we do test children for the HCM and the other cardiomyopathies because of this intense sport training and travel teams and competitive sports because some of the children can have symptoms as early as middle school. Um, some of the presentation can be childhood asthma. One patient told me he was a tall, thin gentleman, but he was always in school with the shorter, rounder children, and he couldn't keep up with them. Um, so we went ahead. This woman had two, um, two marriages. In her first marriage, a daughter and a son, and in the second marriage, an eight-year-old son. And the patient and the husband came in when it was time to test the children. So when the results came back, interestingly enough, the children are all positive. And when I called it out, I talked to the father and I said, the children are positive. And he said, all of the children. 
And I said, all of the children. And he just gasped because all of these children um, have the chance then to develop HCM over their lifetime. And the benefit of this is this young lady hadn't had an echo or an EKG. They were kind of trying to figure out what her symptoms went with. And now we know she's definitely starting to show symptoms and she is positive. So this shows the power of doing cascade testing for family members. It helps us discover things. Um, and then we can make recommendations for sports as well for the kids. Okay, and this is our last case. We had a 66 year old female. She was referred for amyloidosis. Um, she had increasing fatigue, um, mild exertional dyspnea, and the development of lower extremity edema. Um, she went to the emergency room for progression of symptoms. The echo, the echo shows already a reduced ejection fraction, and the echo suggests that she might have amyloidosis. Um, so several months and perhaps a year later, she has numbness and tingling of her feet, um, and she was working as a mail carrier. So they were kind of wondering if it was her job that was causing her um, symptoms. But then she goes on to progress to increasing fatigue um and difficulty swallowing certain foods and then on to atrial flutter um so the workup for an amyloidosis patient is quite interesting because there's a genetic form and there is a senile form that can occur in individuals as they get older but her cardiac mri shows the poor nulling of the myocardium um and it says findings com comparable yeah. with amyloid yeah so essentially mr in those cases um well, I guess the the, uh, the main points for you when you when you see an echocardiogram with thick heart, patients uh, have a history of bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome or spinal stenosis, aortic stenosis. Those things should uh, make you uh, consider or think of uh, amyloid, whether it's ATTR amyloid or AL amyloid. But uh, the combination of neurological symptoms and thick heart should uh, should warrant further workup in general for you. And so when we look, um, her, we've had two, two amyloidosis families, and coincidentally, both are huge. This is the patient. She has this many brothers and sisters. Um, and so when we took the family history, um, we had that the, that the patient's father had cardiomyopathy. The patient's aunt had arrhythmia and a stroke. The patient's uncle had atrial fibrillation, and of course, her grandfather had, her grandmother had cardiomyopathy and died in her 80s. And already she had lost two siblings, an aunt with cardiomyopathy at 56, and then there was, I'm sorry, a sister, and then here a brother who had neuropathy and congestive heart failure. And we kind of, and then there was another brother with congestive heart failure. And this sister had some a pretty complicated neurological picture. And so we went ahead to test the patient. She has, once again, one pathogenic variant in the TTR gene. It's associated with amyloidosis, uh, the genetic form. It is the only gene known to be associated with amyloidosis. Same thing, most cardiac genetic conditions, dominant variable expression and variable penetrance. And so when we went back down to look at the family history and started testing everybody, when we start testing, we start at the same level as the patient or anybody above that's still living. So as we look at this history, we could have guessed before the testing that it was coming from her father and moving down from his mother. So then this leaves us a huge paternal side to test. Anyone who is deceased in the parental level, we start immediately with the children. So from this testing, we have a, you know, we have a positive here, the patient. This one was not tested. Their kids were tested negative. Still doesn't let us know about her. This person is deceased, tested their two children negative. This person was positive, had no children here. 
person's positive, the kids are negative. But interestingly enough, this also informs that this person that passed away would have been positive because two of her three children are positive. So this helps us be able to determine then who is at risk. And it also helps bring them in to see a cardiologist to get the basic imaging of their heart um, and to begin to have make awareness of this condition. This condition, um, the mutations interestingly vary with the ethnicity and the presentation also varies. So a common mutation is a really early onset individuals from Portugal and Brazil, and they have more of the neuropathy, the peripheral and the autonomic, give or take a little cardiomyopathy, but a lot more gastric involvement. And so as we look, um, the mutation can also help predict what are the kind of help that the patient might need from other subspecialties. And this is really a frequently misdiagnosis. Um, this is one to kind of keep on your radar. Um, phenotypes, these are kind of the things that we see, but you'll see a lot of neuropathies. And then these are all the misdiagnoses that patients have had with this condition over the time. So some of them have had a nonspecific diagnosis, but they've had all of these other diagnoses when it really was TTR, and it makes a difference in the treatment. Yeah, again, um, uh, think of amyloid when you see those manifestations, the uh, neuro neurological ones, peripheral neuropathies, spinal stenosis, um, or GI symptoms. Um, really helpful cases, um, Beth. We're going to stop here. I mean, we we, uh, we used a lot of examples, and uh, uh, we talked about other variants, too. See if uh, anyone has questions, too. Dr. Lole, uh, there was a question in the chat and just wondered if you could switch and come back into the camera view. Sure. The, um, the question in the chat from Dr. Hamoy, if I said that correctly, um, says amniocentesis recommended if she was diagnosed before deliveries for your second case that you reviewed was when the question came in. The uh, HCM case, right? It was an autosomal dominant, uh, and and the woman, the the woman that ma married twice, and and all her children had, uh, right. were right. positive. So I don't know if if we got to the children after she already, or, or if we diagnosed her after she already had her children. But let's yes. assume, let's assume we diagnose her. What kind of I mean, yeah, it's an interesting conversation with the patient. What kind of recommendation do you give her if she has autosomal dominant uh, condition regarding having kids? And if she does want to have kids and want, doesn't want to listen, is it yeah. mandatory that she gets an amniocentesis? And does amnio really give a good diagnosis uh, for such conditions? I think I think from the counseling perspective, we spend a lot of time with the patients. And so amnia would certainly be an option if it's something the patient wanted. Um, genetics kind of is never mandatory. So sometimes patients would choose not to have an amnio. Sometimes they would choose to have an amnio that they wanted the information. But kind of with this um, mutation in this patient, we're seeing that she has an eight-year-old who doesn't really have symptoms yet. So with some of these, we would have a definite discussion with the patient and talk about kind of what other patients look like that have the same pathogenic variant. Um, we certainly would give the option of amnio if, if she wanted it to know the information. Um, but a lot of times this is um, not something that a patient would end a pregnancy for. So it's very individual. It certainly could be offered as part of care. Uh, when it comes to, what do you tell them when it comes to uh, wanting to get pregnant in the future? What we do tell them is that, um, especially with the dilated, sometimes they can experience peripartum cardiomyopathy themselves. And so for them, we talk about the risk for them because if there is a genetic component, these component, uh, these 
these mutations actually change, they're actually sarcomeric proteins, so they change the structure of the muscle. And one gene is creating the normal muscle structure and the other is creating this chaotic muscle structure that can be seen under the microscope. So that depending on additional stressors that can cause cardiomyopathy if you don't have a gene, if you're exposing yourself to those and you have a gene, there may be this compound effect that would drive it forward. A lot of the patients I've seen, um, my first patient, she had peripartum cardiomyopathy. She thought she had postpartum depression. She came in, they heard, an, they heard a murmur, they did an EKG and an echo. And then we took her family history and it turned out it, she has a mutation. So as a counselor, we kind of, we offer that, but we do leave it up to the patient. Yeah. Good question. Very much so. I'll give you another one. Uh, <laughs> I, I've had, you know, mothers bring their children uh, after the father passed away suddenly at a young age and having already done a lot of genetic testing and and you know genetic testing is a big word and and not all genetic testing is is equal and and uh, they bring these you know booklets 20 i mean mostly commercial you know genetic testing and 20 percent chance of this 18 percent chance of that 17 6.5 percent it's really hard to make up any kind of you know clarity as far as counseling is I guess you know the the answer is they have to go to a super specialized person and do these things in a super specialized lab, right? And that's a great question. There's also um, we are also very careful to explain the difference between 23andMe and the Ancestry.com because they would include some of the genes um, that are more common, but they're not including all variants and they're not sequencing the whole gene. Um, and so usually when we see patients, we have a we have a very frank discussion with them and it becomes more difficult if there is a sudden cardiac death in an individual. Um, I've seen several that have come back after they've died. Um, but what we usually do is a comprehensive panel of 168 genes that covers the arrhythmias and it covers the cardiomyopathies. Um, we usually. Uh, having a family history of sudden cardiac death at an early age um, is certainly an indicator that testing would be appropriate. So we can offer the testing. Um, we also take the family history of the person that has passed away to see if there's anything else in there that they're not thinking about. You know, is there a history of syncope? Is there a history of anything else that would give us a clue um, to why the person died suddenly. And those counseling sessions are a little bit tough because of the person that just passed and all of those emotional um, issues that come up. Did that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. It's a very complicated uh, topic, but yes, it certainly helps. I don't see any hands raised, so I'm I'm on a roll here, and and this is very uh, very dear to me, the familial uh, the FH, uh, Dr. George, and 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 I there's not a week that goes by that I don't pick up an FH every other week yeah. maybe, and and uh, so immediate diagnosis, and and I tell them have everyone check their lipid profile and their family. I mean, I guess it's a simple question. When do we check? So the diagnosis is clear. They have manifestation. They have pre. If you go by the Dutch criteria, by any, any they have the diagnosis. Right. When do you do genetic testing for them? Um, or do you do you do genetic testing for them? I I still do it. So if they're if they're if they have kids, I do it to get the cascade testing for further uh, 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 kids. Um, if not, uh, I I just find it interesting to see. Um, uh, what uh, familial hyperlipidemia they have, because it could be FH, it could be the familial combined hyperlipidemia. And so uh, it's just, to me at least, it's more the curiosity of figuring out, is it truly FH or one of those uh, rare ones? Even though 
you're, you're going to treat the same way for now at least. And if I might say add here, um, studies have shown that patients who actually have a pathogenic variant, that flips a switch for them and suddenly the rigorous diet and all of the things that they need to do to manage this is no problem now. For some reason, when they have that genetic result, um, it is something that, and I've had a couple of patients say, well, if I don't have a mutation, then I'm going to do 80-20 with the diet instead of 100%. But it, it gives them that internal incentive to be more adherent with their medication and, and more restrictive with their diet and exercise and following the indications that are truly recommended for this. And if you diagnose FH at a younger age and a woman in childbearing age, do you still hold uh, lipid lowering therapy around the time of pregnancy? I, I read recently there was some a, some reassurance that it's not as bad even during pregnancy. To be honest with you, I've, I've been in practice for three years, so I have not had that difficult conversation yet. I, you know, traditionally, uh, we've been taught that it's contraindicated, but... Uh, and and so I don't know at this point. I need to go back and see what other options we have to offer them. And to be honest with you, I don't I don't think it will change a whole lot. Even if you stop therapy for a year, it's more uh, the long term effect. I mean, if you, I don't think if you go off statin therapy for six months or nine months, that would change your uh, to total outcome. Estrogens are protective during pregnancy, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Anyone else? Is there, uh, yeah, anyone else who has a question? We have a few more minutes if you want, if we we can stay, if there's anyone else who didn't get a chance. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lole and Beth for your presentation. And I will put the evaluation uh, link in the chat as, as we end this meeting. Uh, we appreciate all the information that you shared. And if anyone has any other questions or if anything else comes up, Dr. Lole is available through email. And please feel free to uh, send him a message to ask your question. And uh, that concludes our program for tonight. Thank you very much for participating. We look forward to having you participate in another, an upcoming presentation on uh, August the 10th on heart valve disease. So thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you guys.